got just a few minutes. We always have a bunch of people pile in right at the end here. So we're gonna wait till two, two on the dot. Hi y'all, can you make me maybe a co-host? Cause I oh, can yeah. do my video. How did you get not a co-host? Because I made Jesse a host and I guess that <laughs> bumped me off. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm not a co-host either. Hi Kelly, welcome. <laughs> Poor Kelly. I just want to know, I did get my coffee after the third time in the microwave. I truly wanted a cup of coffee between my one meeting and my next meeting. I'm going to start building buffers into meetings. Like every after every meeting, you need to have a 15 minute buffer, but then you're going to, that meeting will go into that buffer and then you'll lose it again. So. Yeah. See, Jesse's mug scared me because it made me imagine coffee that tasted like Old Bay. I, I was not. No, you know, bro. Did you did you go somewhere to get that, or I mean, where do they make Old Maryland. Bay? I was in Maryland when we got this. Oh, cool. We took a road trip one year and got it at a little store. I was surprised. The one training I did in Maryland. No, I'm sorry. I was in Delaware. In Delaware. And they had Old Bay for sale in the Holiday Inn like snack shop. I'm like, what, what am I gonna? I guess to put on my microwave popcorn. Or maybe just for Old Bay emergencies? Um, I know we had this discussion in other meetings, but have you tried the Old Bay hot sauce? No. So good. We don't do that in Iowa. <laughs> you don't do hot sauces? Oh, we do hot sauce. It's just not Old Bay. I probably could buy Old Bay at the grocery store if I wanted to. It's just not a thing. Like, put that on all our delicious regional mollusks. We are almost at three o'clock, so you get to hear us chat for a little bit longer. Hopefully, we're saying very interesting things. Um, I was just thinking of I'm going to put the agenda into chat, but as I do that, and what we're watching the. Top Chef that took place in South Carolina. We're working our way backwards, and they just keep on talking about sorghum oh, sure. as a as a seasoning. And I had never heard of it. I had to Google it. So, okay, you've heard of it, Andrew. You're not from the South. You said it was a Southern thing. It is. I I don't know. Isn't it like little? It's very tiny, tiny round. Um, grain or noodles it's very high in fiber no mm -mm. we're not talking this about is this is like thing. no this is like a sweetener like a, yeah like a syrup right oh yeah not the same thing it could be the same plant surely be. someone in our audience is is a librarian at an agricultural school and knows all about sorghum and is just jumping up and down in their seat right now <laughs> oh. we are recording this if, as Andrew said, put something in the chat. If you have any questions, we also have a Q&A box. Both of those will be stored. So we're able to answer your questions, whether live or we say, oh, we haven't thought of that. And we will get back to you and create a whole question and answer blog post to make sure everybody gets all the answers that anybody's ever wanted about Koha 2005. We are also doing this from YouTube Live. So if you have anybody who couldn't get in for some reason, if we're at our maximum, which I don't think we are, we are also um, doing this through YouTube Live and Jesse is monitoring that chat. Oh, see, Jane knows about sorghum. I'm still on sorghum. I was thinking of sorghum molasses, but then also, yeah, the seeds could be popped like popcorn. That makes sense. See, that's what I was talking about, the seeds. They're so very- the same fiber. thing. Yeah, same thing. So I've eaten them before like that. I've made it with like carrots and chickpeas and like some seasonings. It's very good. I've never seen this as seeds or as molasses or anything in the New England. I'll have to go looking. Uh, if we had more time, I'd totally run into the pantry. I know we have some in there. <laughs> this Maybe is a new video end. series for you. <laughs> Last week with, was earrings. This week we're talking about... Yep. Jane, I don't know, where's Jane from? Is Jane from somewhere in the South or just she knows more than? Oregon. 
she's just she's just tapped into sorghum. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Well, we're a little over three. Should we <laughs> give this thing a little start? Go for it. Okay. So I have gone ahead and linked the agenda to the chats for anybody who wants to follow along. We are going to start in the OPAC. And actually, for once, we have quite a bit in the OPAC that we were going to show you, which is exciting because sometimes it's not as most popular area of um, Koha to do things. Oh, I can't share my screen. Give me one second. <laughs> Literally hidden share. Okay. Okay. The staff client, let's pop over to the OPAC. One of the first new features in the OPAC that we I want to talk to you about is the ability to send an error report to the librarian about something going on in the OPAC. A patron does need to be logged in to send a error report to the library, but once they are logged in, they will have the option to go ahead and send that. Regardless if they're logged in or not, as a user, and if this system preference, which we'll talk about in a second, is turned on, they will see report a problem on every page that they go to. So even if they're in a specific bib level record, they will have the option to go ahead and report a problem. So it's way down here. This is system preference that you would need to set up in your um, global system preferences. And we'll talk about that in a second, but let's go ahead and send an error report. Log in. Change my password before so no one knows what I actually am you know, typing. <laughs> if I am a logged in patron, I have the option to click report a problem. The page that I will be brought to will give me an option to who I send this issue to. And I have two options or just one depending on the library's choice. I have a librarian or the COHA administrator. So if the, lib if the library specific email is set up, that's where that will go. If libraries don't have a specific email for a branch, then it would go to the COHA administrator the problem page, you'll see the second half of the URL in this page, and that will tell the staff this error happened on this exact dip record. It says the username of the person. Um, you can give a subject and a message. Error. And then the patron will be given a um, response that says your report problem report has been sent to the library. Like so many fantastic things that get to be done in the OPAC, this will also, in addition, be emailed. It will be seen on the staff client on the bottom. So if I pop over to the staff client in that bottom area, I will have a new option that says OPAC problem reports pending. I have a lot of a I have a lot of reports issues. I have a lot of issues, I guess you could say. This screen, if anybody is using patron checkout notes, it looks a lot like that. So we have a nice table that you can go ahead and, and mark something viewed, mark something closed, and clean them out as you deal with them. Let's see. Okay, there's my error. Nope, that's not my error. Hope I have an error right there. So here is the link that got sent, my subject and my message, where the email was sent, the patron that sent it, and that's a clickable link. And I could say market viewed or market closed to say, hey, I've resolved this and I can clear it out of this list. This is a system, this is a system preference to turn on as well as this is a permission for a staff member to monitor these errors. The system preference is called 
Ooh, good question. As I'm looking for the system preference. OPAC report problem. So either allow or don't allow patrons to submit problem reports for OPAC pages. There is a good question. Is there a way to respond automatically to the patron who reported the error? No, but that's a great idea. So right now there isn't. Um, you just get the message happen. There's no way currently to send a message back, but I appreciate that thought. Yeah, I could absolutely see a maybe like a resolution status that you would set it to that would generate a notice then. Looks yeah, because like the person has to be logged in. So we get, we have the information about the patron. Um, we found out yesterday that people were typing as we started talking. So I'm taking an extra pause. <laughs> okay, moving on. Another fantastic new thing that's been added to the OPAC is the ability to load your library information onto the OPAC. So let me go back to my home, even though you can see it here. We have a new clickable link underneath your search bar called libraries. If you're a multi-branch or if you are a single branch, just library. This link will bring your patrons to all the branches that are currently in your Koha system under libraries. So that's under admin and we'll pop over there in a second. It will list the address, the phone number, the fax number and a URL, whatever is filled out in that form. Taking it one step further, if your OPAC information box is filled out, once a user clicks the name of the library from that list, they will get more information about the lot itself. So let's pop over to see where this is pulling from in the staff clients. I like this little um, thumbnail thing on the right hand side. Perfect. Perfect. Go to your. So we're starting. If we started at home, we would go to administration, and then under administration, we're going to go to this library option. This is where we fill out our address, our phone number, which populates into our notices and slips. But now it also can populate information into your OPAC. So like I showed you on the East Branch, I get all that information. And then under OPAC info is where that little, pretty little Giphy is coming from. And if I edit, this is this information. So again, Library information will be stored at that library um, option below the search bar. We had in our last webinar a question to say, hey, we have some branches that we don't want users to see. And I know Lucas got us some jQuery. We're gonna put that in the Q&A blog post as well. So if you do have branches like a technical service branch or a storage, offsite storage that you're using as a branch, we can certainly hide any of those that you need. Okay, last but certainly not least is like my personal favorite. This will give you a um, good feeling to know. Sometimes when you put in an enhancement request into Bugzilla, it just happens, it gets done for you. So um, if your library is using star ratings on the OPAC, which means that a user can go ahead and mark a book with the number of stars that it believes it earned through the searching of the catalog. If you're using that, you're now your users will also have the opportunity to star rate books that are both checked out as well as in their reading history tab. Again, if you're storing that information for them. So here I can go ahead and give, oh, I get like, Ten, five stars to something that I've currently checked out and returned to the library, I can go ahead and star that here. And that will get pushed out to all the rest of the patrons using this catalog to say, hey, somebody's read this and gave it five stars. Or if Andrew, myself, and Jesse 
all rated the same book and our average was three and a half stars, it would say out of three people, this app got three and a half stars. So again, just something really um, maybe simple, but I always thought that star ratings were kind of not as helpful if you're searching for books in the catalog, but maybe something you have currently checked out. Um, you can go ahead and say, this is a five-star book right before you return it. I'm gonna go to the system preference. If it is not turned on, you can absolutely turn this on for your system through this system preference, this global system preference called OPAC star ratings. There are a few options in your OPAC star ratings that you can allow users to only add that star rating on the detail page of the, the record, the results, and the user. So for this case scenario that I'm showing you, you would want to make sure that first result is picked results, details, and user, because then that user could go ahead and mark those star ratings. Hi, I didn't know who was Hi. first. <laughs> Jesse um, and I both made, we're gonna read a question face. Um, we have a question that came in and asked, you know, if you're currently not using the star ratings, how can they get started with that, Kelly? Yep, so here's your system preference, OPAC star ratings. And go ahead and give it a whirl. So in any case, you would need to make this either only details or results details and users, but to be able to mark it from your checkout history and your reading history for your patrons, you would need to pick the results details and user option. And this system preference exists in 1911, which you're on now. It just right now only has two options. It's either on just for that details page or off. In 2005, you'll have that third option that makes it show more places. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. There are plenty of other OPEC things that we cannot get into because we only can we only get 90 minutes with y'all. Hope you guys have set aside 90 minutes for us. But maybe Andrew or Jesse can link to the OPAC specific module blog post that gives you more things. Um, the add a report option on your OPAC page, there is a blog post and a tutorial video that you can share with your patrons. So this is geared towards your patrons. So you can absolutely share that with your um, public. Jesse and I actually showed you how to do that in a Monday Minutes on how to add a YouTube video to your OPAC. So that's something you can do. As well as the same thing with the star ratings. There's a blog post and a patron tutorial if you wanna share that with your patrons. Okay, going down on the agenda, we are now on patrons and CERC, one of our bigger areas that we love to see all the things that we're adding to um, Koha 2005. Oh my goodness, guys, we didn't even, oh my goodness, folks, we didn't even talk to you about 2005. <laughs> for our partners, we are looking at a release of January for your systems to be upgraded. As always, we'll give you a little red box on your staff client to let you know about a week ahead of time so you're ready. And all you can do on that morning of your upgrade, you just have to clear your cache and you're ready to go. So. Look for it in January. We're all looking forward to 2021. I believe we are. Okay. This is fantastic. Like, took me a while to understand what the purpose of this would be, but now that I've understood, um, Koha is introducing a point of sale feature in Koha. Point of sale, what does that mean? How can I use this, you ask? This is the ability to track payments and sales outside of your patron database. So currently you can bill patrons for um, copier fees, new cards, and you go to the patron account and you bill them that way. And then you pay for the items through their accounting tab. The point of sale feature that's coming in 2005 will allow you to sell things outside of your patrons so you can just ring up a couple of book sales or a book bag in Koha and track those payments through the, um, the system. So that's pretty fun. 
we have a few things that we need to turn on to make sure that you have this option in your system. The first one, pretty simple point of sale, I think is the system preference. Point of sale. We need to make sure that this is enabled first. So you need to enable your point of sale feature if you do want to use this. Koha reminds you, hey, if you turn this on, you also need to turn on use cash registers. This was a feature in 1911, um, the ability to define cash registers within Koha. Anybody use those in 1911, I wonder? Once, good. oh, Jesse has, okay. <laughs> So enable point of sale and also cash, use cash registers. So if you are first time user for both these, you're gonna do these two system preferences and set this to use. We have a great blog post that links from this blog post. It tells you how to set up cash registers in Koha. So they are linked in that blog post that's linked on the agenda. But these two system preferences need to be done then under the admin module, there will be, oh good, somebody uses cash registers. There will be, um, so there's your cash register option. Just in case you haven't set that up, you can go ahead and define a cash register, define what library it's being used at, a default register. Let me just pop over there. So you can see I have four. Um, this bolded one is the one that would default to being used at the main library. We can put the amount of money that we start the drawer with every day or every week, however, however often you um, cash out. And then you can see I have a cash register set up at the East Branch and at the North Branch, and I have two at the main branch. And I'm gonna do this little paparoo. I'm gonna change my library. Set myself over to the main one because I've got two. So cash registers, check, we're on step three. Another step you want to do is say, tell Koha what you're selling. So under admin, there is debit types. Now debit types are new to 1911 as well, being able to define things that you're charging your patrons. Again, new card, copier fees, earbuds, just a manual fee, whatever you want to charge your patrons. Now you have the ability to mark more debit types, maybe specific to what you're selling through the point of sale, or if you're selling these through point of sale and also tracking them through patrons, depending on your customer, you can assign new debit types. So I went ahead and created a book bag. I love a good library book bag. If I go into a library and they're selling a book bag, I'm a sucker. You create a code, you can choose the Default amount. So how much does this book bag cost to the patron or to your visitor? A description. Then you have two options. Can this be manually invoiced? So that means can I charge a patron directly for it? And can this be sold? So out through that point of sale feature. And then if this is limited to a specific library, I can choose my library limitation. You can see I have a few. My book bag, I can sell to both my patrons and um, through my point of sale, through book my book sale items, I can only do through my book point of sale. So if I went to a patron's account, that wouldn't be a manual invoice I would see. Okay, step four, cross that off the list. You've done that. I wonder, people can tell us what they sell. Like maybe they're selling merchandise. I can't remember, I worked with a library. They had a whole merchandising section in their library. Um, so this is going to be great for them, a gift shop and everything. Now, once you've done all that set up, it's all downhill from here. From your, <laughs> all uphill from here, all. Downhill in the sense that it's easy, like riding a bike down a hill. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And skiing down a hill. You have the point of sale here on the main page. We'll have the point of sale in your drop down more button, which kind of got me off kilter a bit because they're putting it in the middle of where I usually know where to go. Is that alphabetical, Andrew? It doesn't look alphabetical either. Now, through the point of sale purchase, 
you can go ahead and start a transaction that you can say, hey, this person is buying a bag and maybe they're buying some books, three books, and they're all a dollar. Yes, Jesse. We have a question that came in about tax. Ooh. If we can add tax in, and I'm, we haven't tested that yet, but I can see Andrew's already typing away. I mean, we have the system preference, GIST, but that ties into acquisitions. I'm not sure if we could get that to tie into the point of sale. I just said something in that system preference. Let's see if it- Oh, you did? Okay. I okay that's that what I was gonna do. Point of sale. We so rarely touch sales tax for anything. Yeah. Um, so you've already done it. Should I refresh my page? Yeah, refresh the page. I don't think it's going to automatically calculate. I think your best bet would be to include tax yeah. in the cost you tell acquisitions. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Like if it's 7%, 107. Mm -hmm. you know. Yep. Yep. So when oh, you set that default cost, you would actually already have that cost in there. Yeah. Georgette, we've got good news for you in a second about oh. balancing the drawer out. Yes, we do. This is fantastic. So I've added some things to my transaction. Over on the, the right-hand side, you sold. So I have a couple of book sale items, and then I have my Friends of the Library book bag. And then down here, I have, hey, are you collecting payment for these things? How much the patron needs to owe? If I'm taking a $40 bill, it will give me the amount of change I'm going to give back to that patient. What payment type I'm making. So probably I would want to pick, choose cash if I'm using the cash drawer. If you pick something outside of cash, then it will not kind of go into your cash drawer because it's an outside system. Maybe if you're doing amnesty or checks. And then which cash register you are taking the payment on. Gives me a little reminder. Don't forget to give back your the change of $17 to your patron. I get a little yellow box. I can go ahead and print a receipt for my patron, my visitor to the library. Make it a little bigger. Gives me my library, um, my library name, which is 2005, the branch that it was made at, the, the date what I sold, and I can go ahead and print that for my patron if I want. This is a new notice that's being added to your notices and slip, and it is called receipt. So like every notice and slip in Koha, it can be customized. So if you wanted to alter that in any way, that's definitely possible. Now that we have done our point of sale, now we get to answer Georgette's question, or do we have any other questions? We've got a, a, a slew of them. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, yeah, so working from the bottom up, yes, that receipt could be large. That is customizable. It's a, a new notice over in your notices and slips area. Um, Deb and Bonnie, I had to scroll up to see who asked the first question, asked very related questions. Bonnie asked, does this work with PayPal, with the Koha PayPal integration? And Deb asked, do I understand that a credit payment would not work in Koha? This is not going to process a credit card payment. This is really recording that that payment happened. So like credit card is an option in that payment type dropdown. So you would process the credit card payment through whatever card reader you have and then record in Koha that that payment happened. Similarly, this is not gonna process a PayPal payment right here. If you want patrons to pay via the existing PayPal integration, you would wanna do that as a manual invoice, which applies a charge to their card, which they could then go pay on the OPAC. But yeah, there's just sort of enough security concern in making Koha actually be a credit card processor or a PayPal processor that the Koha community is not eager to get into that. It's it's a lot more responsibility on, on you all and on the software for, for keeping everybody's information private. 
And we have one more question that came in on YouTube and, and Jerry is asking if we can talk a little bit about point of sale for libraries and consortias. And Jerry, Kelly will cover um, administration, which is configuring those cash registers where they can be set to branch locations um, in the system. Yep, yep. When we went into the cash register configuration a little bit earlier, we can allocate when we create a cash register, what branch it's associated with. So I'm taking, I'm logged in at the main branch. I took cash at the main branch. So when I do my cash up, I will be only doing it for the cash register one and somebody else could be doing the desk cash register at the East branch. So this is 100% um, able to be done dip by branch specifically. And Ultimately, if a branch is not doing this, they don't need to be part of this either. And when they don't set up a register, they won't have that option. Yep. Well, and, and debit types also can be limited to a specific branch. So if That's true. some libraries are selling book bags and some are not, we make book mm -hmm. bags not available to those. Yeah, so maybe only at the main branch are they selling book bags or cheese or whatever. So again, if I go into my debit type, if I were to say that book bags are only being sold at one branch, I would choose that under my library limitation. And then at the East branch, I couldn't sell book bags if I don't have them. They will not be shown on my point of sale transaction. Great questions. Thank you. Ooh. Carolyn asked the question, can you have different default amounts per debit type per library? So I would take this maybe one step further. I would make a specific debit type code for book bag East branch, make that cost and limit it to the East branch. But I might always put it in the code as well, just to be safe. But yes, if you are limiting by branch, you can do a different um, cost. So fun, this is great. Okay, the one other thing that I'm gonna talk about with point of sale is the ability to cash up at the end of the day or the end of the week. So now Koha will allow you to be able to tell you how much you've taken and how much you need to take out of your drawer in point of sale feature. Let me go back to my cash registers. Go to my point of sale. From my point of sale, I'm going to have an option over on the left. Again, I love when Koha integrates them. So I actually have a lot of options over here on the left, meaning I don't have to go back to my home if I needed to add more items for purchase, if I needed to configure my cash registers, if I need to change anything, I do have that option on the left. If I go to register details, I have the ability to record a cash up. So it will tell me when the last time I'm here specifically on main library register one, it will tell me the last time I did a cash up. It will tell me how much I'm floating. So how much I should retain at the end and Koha will also take that out when I do my cash up, how much I took in at the cash register, how much I spent, like if I refunded somebody, and then how much I should take out. So a question we had on Tuesdays, what's new is can we issue a refund? So if somebody says, oh, I don't oh, yeah, have this bag, I can go ahead and refund the sale of a book bag or a book when they said they've read it on accident. I still, I love this too. I can print a receipt now at this point. So if I needed receipts for my own purposes, I can go ahead and create more paper, just create more paper. So, ooh, the next thing I need to do is just record my cash up. And this will tell me, hey, you need to take out this much money and you'll be left with $10. Once I do that, then my cash up will be back to zero and $10 will be in my float. Do you want me to, can I answer this question? 
Sure. Uh, George, asked, George asked, is there a report to reconcile that? Sorry, my screen's in the way of my screen. To reconcile, it breaks it down by each debit. Um, yes. So all of these sales go into the same account lines table that all your fines and fees and, and things that tie to a borrower go into. So we have that same level of specificity of, and we sold this many book bags last week to really break down where all that money came from. Uh, so that's very reportable. And then also each of those cash up actions gets recorded as like on this date, Kelly ran a cash up for this register and took $80 out. So you've got a, a really strong data trail there. I'm sure we will be doing some writing of reports as people dive into this and we figure out exactly what they want to really report all that. But yeah, the data is definitely there. It's great. I love that all the math is done for me <laughs> in the catch up. I think I have one more, but is there any other questions for point of sale, cash up? There is a blog post um, for this point of sale that goes through all these steps um, that you can go ahead and, and, and do that setup once you get upgraded to 2005 and get really excited to start selling your book sale items. Or I think people should really tell me if they're selling things at their library and what it is. I mean, I'd love to know what people are selling. I mean, currently probably not as much now as they were last year, but um, somebody, I think Andrew was the one that said cheese and I cannot stop thinking about a library selling cheese. Maybe it happens. Okay, I have one more thing to talk about before I pass this on to Andrew. And that is Koha is now allowing libraries to add the ability to renew items once the fines have been paid. So if I had an overdue book and I paid those fines, Koha can go ahead and renew that item for me. Currently, it does not work like that. This will not be something that is turned on automatically. This will be something you would want to turn on. And this actually has two system preferences. Uh, I have no idea what the system preference is called, but maybe I will stumble, stumble upon it. Renew <laughs> fine. Nope, renew. There it is. Renew, oh, I was so close. So from the staff client, the option would be renew accruing item when paid. So if a patron pays off all fines on an overdue item, renew the item automatically. Now note, we need to make sure that your system preference renewal period base is set to due dates. If it is set to due dates, that it could still be overdue because your renewal period base, the option right below it, it is asking you when an item is renewed, what date am I basing your new due date on? Am I basing it on today's date, the date that the fine was paid, or am I basing it on the old due date, which would, even if renewed, could still make that item overdue. So those two kind of work together. And then the other system preference that got introduced with the same bug is if you are allowing patrons to pay fines on the OPAC through PayPal, would you like this same process to happen? So if I paid my fines on the OPAC, do you want Koha to go ahead and renew those items? We had a question yesterday, uh, or the last day we had our what's new, and they wanted to know, well, what if it's on hold for somebody else? Koha will happily take the money, but then say, sorry, it can't be renewed because it's on hold. So those renewal, Fees, those renewal rules still apply. It's a matter of paying a fine and then having it renewed if possible. Pretty fantastic. 
So again, this is not turned on. You can allow this to, to be turned on um, and give the opportunity so those renewals happen and save your staff some clicks. Is it my turn? I think it is, unless anyone right. has any questions, but. <laughs> we'll see. I'll give them a second. No, it may, it may come up, it may come up. Okay, I've got a couple patrons insert things for you. Uh, the first one relates to our old friend, the Mark Lost Items as Returned System Preference. So this is a, a, a pretty deep system preference that really changes how Koha handles lost stuff. So as I go along here, some of these, some of your libraries might not act exactly the way I'm showing. Um, so I'm just grabbing my chat back because I saw a question popped up. Uh, Francisca yeah. said, we're fine free now. Should we turn that feature on or is it null? Um, if you're fine free, then that system preference really will not will not matter because you're not ever going to have a fine paid off. So I would say leave it turned off and just don't worry about it. Um, it is off by default, meaning should somehow you get an overdue fine, paying it off won't renew anything. All right, mark lost items is returned. So this asks when an item has become lost, is it still considered checked out to the patron? And there are a bunch of options in here. This new development has added another option here for when receiving payment. So let me walk through this a little bit. If you are not marking lost items as returned, that means when a given patron loses an item, so my pretend patron here had Batman in the Animated Series Volume 3 checked out, and they lost it, and they got billed for it. So they owe us $29.31. And we told Koha, do not mark that as returned. Consider it still checked out to this patron. Prior to 2005, it has always been the behavior that if I have a lost item that I owe money on and I have not marked it as returned, as soon as I don't owe money on this lost item anymore, it is marked as returned. It is no longer checked out to the patron. Because at that point, either they've returned it and it is actually back in the building, or they've paid it off and they're not really responsible for it anymore. But some libraries wanted the option to do that differently, to say my patron paid my lost, their lost item off and I want it to stay on their record until I manually remove it. So now we have a new option over here that says, when receiving payment for the item, I have unchecked that on our system, which means if I come back to my fake patron and I pay off that lost fee, doo -doo -doo, sure, let's do that in cash. At my cash register. Now that, has not removed that checkout. So my item is still tied to this patron and is still lost. They don't owe me any money anymore. So it's really leaving it there for me to address manually. Great if you're doing a little more case by case specific stuff and you don't wanna just sort of have Koha blanket doing these things automatically for you. But by default, this will be marked, correct, Andrew? Correct, yeah, because back here in the system preference, if this box is checked, if when receiving payment for an item is checked, that maintains the behavior that Koha has had for years and years and years. So that's gonna be the default. When you get upgraded, that new box will be checked and your behavior will not change automatically. You would have to come in here and manually adjust that system preference to make it do something different. Now I'm pausing just because the system preference is always confusing. Sort of delves into an area that we don't have great vocabulary around. We'll see. As soon as I start talking about something else, a question will pop up. 
So my next thing in patrons in CERC is local hold groups. This is actually, this is a really cool development. It's going to make a lot of CERC rules a lot easier for big consortia. Um, and this was sponsored by our friends at Vocal, the Vermont Organization of Koha Automated Libraries, which I always have to read off the list because I never remember exactly what it stands for. Uh, Francisco asked, if we make changes to the system now, will I transfer later in January to the release? Um, you would not be able to change the system preference now because that option just isn't there. So unless I'm misunderstanding your question, there, there's no way to change this now. You'd have to wait till you get the upgrade to have the option. If you changed any of these other things that are already options. Oh, we need changes in general. I'm not quite sure what that means. I'm sorry if you. Yeah, some of these things that we're talking about today will not appear until you are upgraded. So we are showing you fantastic things that you don't have options for probably right now. Some you do. OPAC star ratings example was one of those where that system preference does exist. It gets a little bit more specific in 2005, but some things like this system preference, that option just doesn't ex exist yet for your 1911 version. Great. Uh, there is not a blog post for this new mark lost items as returned yet. Um, Perhaps a Monday minute. That would probably be a good Monday minutes. Yeah. Uh, and George, uh, Georgette says she has a question about lost. Let her rip, Georgette. I'm going to. Oh, <laughs> when an item is long overdue lost, it is a bit confusing. Can it just be made lost? Sure. Yeah. If you've got that automated cron setting things to long overdue lost when they hit so many days overdue. We could tell that to just use lost instead. The distinction is really just meant to be helpful to you all to be able to see at a glance, was this marked lost manually or marked lost automatically? If it would be more clear for you all to just make them all fall into one, one lost bucket, we could do that. Just um, open up a ticket and we'll, we'll make some adjustments. You're welcome. Okay, hold groups, sponsored by Vocal. Yay, Vocal. Let me come. Oops, here and go to library groups. So groups already exist in Koha for purposes of searching and patron data. 2005 is adding a new option is a local hold group. So if we set up local hold groups, this is telling Koha in this case, East Branch and Main Branch work holds together as a unit and North Branch and West Branch work holds together. So this is for like a consortia where you've got 20 libraries, like a mix of public and school and maybe the five school libraries in there share materials between them, but don't share materials with the public libraries as a whole. So those school libraries can be their own hold group, which means when we get over to our circ and fine rules, we can say, look at East Branch. If I'm looking and see, we're based on items. So if I'm looking at an item from the East Branch, only patrons who are in that local hold group that contains East Branch can put a hold on it. So here's an example record. This, this, on this bib, I have four items, one at East Branch, and then one at each of my other branches, Main, Northwest. So if I go to put a hold on here, oops for my pretend patron who is from the North branch. Based on my hold groups, 
she can only place holds on north and west. She cannot get that main book or that east book because they're outside of her hold group. So previously to do this sort of grouping where like these five libraries behave differently than these five libraries was pretty complicated. This is hugely simplifying this. I was talking to uh, some folks over in Idaho last night who I think we, we simplified everybody's lives greatly here. And I was very excited to get that like in place. So hooray, this is a great one. I'm super excited about this. See, Lizette says, I'm not even lying. We really did make their hold rules work good. And Elena as well. I thought, I thought we had some Belknap people in here. Okay, those are my two patrons in Cirque. So I'm gonna punt over to Jesse for the last three in there. Once I find my stop share button. There we go. All right. Okay. So the next few that I am going to talk about will hopefully help speed up some of your workflows in the patrons module. So the first one is going to be the addition of a new system preference. It is called collapse fields patron ad form. So when staff are creating new patrons or editing a patron in the system, this will allow you to have certain fields collapsed by default. You know, alternative address is probably one of the first ones where in previous releases of Koha, we would use the borrower unwanted fields. So those did not show within the form. Now you have the option to just collapse them. So, you know, maybe if you're in a region where you have, um, people that may live there part of the year and then travel to another location in other times and you wanna keep alternative contact information in there, this is a great way to do it. So you can see there's several new options that you can select. The boxes that are checked will be collapsed by default. So let's take a look at what that would look like. When you're in the patrons module and you select a new patron, I'm gonna say we're gonna create a resident here. You'll notice at the top, I have a box and that will say show collapsed fields. By default, when I'm scrolling through, you'll notice that alternate address and alternate contact are collapsed. So I can easily move through to exactly what I need to fill out for that patron. I can click on it here within the record and that will expand it. Or if I am up at the top, I can select that and that will open all of the fields right within that record. So again, just a really nice way to kind of make that patron form clean for you when you're working through and creating a new patron in the system. The next enhancement that I'll show you is again, a new system preference. And this one is called Prefill guarantee field. This allows you to select certain fields that will be filled when you are adding a guarantee to a guarantor patron. So for those of you who are using the feature in Koha, which allows you to, again, connect that guarantee and guarantor, whether it's you know a, a family, mother, father, child, um, guardian at litem, you know, aunt or uncle, whatever the relationship is. If you're using that, when you're creating um, that um, guarantee, this will pre-fill those fields. So from this drop-down menu, you'll see there's about 32 different options. And in previous releases of Koha, it was it would just copy over certain fields and you had no control over it. So now you can control which fields are being copied. So in this case, you can see we have about 13 of those selected. So copying over the address and all of the contact um, information like phone, email, right within the system. So let's look at how that will be um, when you're creating that, that patron. So I'm gonna go to uh, Laura. Ingles, and um, we are going to add Rose um, to her account. If I can remember where she is, there she is. So when I click on that add guarantee, it will now populate the fields um, that we've selected. So anything that was in that main address and then anything that was in that contact information. So it will easily, um, you know, fill in that information. So again, just a nice way to uh, populate that information for you. 
before you leave patron records, uh, Rebecca Court had a question. Could you add an arrow to those collapsed field headers to show that it is collapsed? I imagine we could, that seems doable. I mean, the assumption here is just if you are seeing the field header with nothing below it, you can click to expand. But I, I don't see any reason why we couldn't add a little arrow. Yeah, yeah. I also want to say that even though she has some already picked in the system preference, you still can collapse them when you're in the form. So mm -hmm. it's that's not clear in the system preference, but you could go ahead and collapse something just by to get rid of it. And, and it, that doesn't need to be driven by the system preference. Yeah, Donna suggested that when filling out a new patron, you could just collapse each section as you finish filling it out, which mm -hmm. is like mm -hmm. nice and clean. I like that idea. I like that idea. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, the last one I will show you today is in the item search, which you know is a favorite of ours. And if you are in the staff client and we come over to that search drop down menu, we all know we have the advanced search. In the item search, we now have a new feature. So when you come in and you're you know, selecting how you want to search. So let's say I want to look for maybe titles in the main library and a, a certain shelving location. Again, I can select um, the additional parameters I need. I can either export or output to the screen, which will give me my results on the next page, or quickly download a CSV or barcodes file. In this enhancement, when I perform that search and I get my results on the next page, this gives me a really clean look where I can see the rows and the columns for all of those titles. So right now I have about 316 entries. Maybe I only want four or five of those to make changes to. You'll notice now that we have a column here that allows us to select certain rows from that table. So now instead of exporting all 316 of those and massaging the data outside of Koha, I can say, just give me those four that I need. And then I can come up here and I can either export that as a CSV file, which will give me all the information um, in that particular table for those four rows, or I can say, let me download a barcodes file. And then that would just bring those barcodes for those four selected items. So again, just a great way that, you know, if you're running a report or you need to do some batch modifications of items, this allows you to do that pretty quickly and easily. Okay. Okay, I'm pausing briefly for questions, but Next up, I have some tech services stuff. So let me share this screen. And see, every time I stop sharing my screen and then reshare it, Zoom hides my chat window. It's very frustrating. My first tech services thing is to do with uh, this system preference item call number. So this is the system preference that says when I add a new item to a bib, where in the bib should I look to pull the call number that goes in the item? Previously, this only knew how to look at one mark field. So if you were a Dewey library, you could say, yeah, go to the 082, and it would always grab that 082 out of the bib and put it in the item, and maybe sometimes that wouldn't be what you wanted. Uh, the example that we I've run into most often is, again, like with Dewey libraries, public libraries tend to make their nonfiction Dewey, but not really their fiction. Usually that's some local scheme that's like FIC in the author's name or something. And so this just wouldn't work for them. It would continually put that actual Dewey number into the item record, which is not, not the worst thing, but it makes you have to change those over and over again. So now, this system preference can take multiple mark fields and it will check them sequentially. So the way I have this set up now, every time I add an item to a bib, it's going to check the 092 and then the 082. So if I've got an 092 value, which is your, your locally assigned call number, it'll use that. But if there is not an 092, it'll fail over to the 082 next. So, 
Let me grab a record. This is one I just Z3950'd in. If I scroll down, actually let's use the handy dandy links. I have an 082. It is a, actually I have like part of an 082. That's kind of useless. I suppose that would have some Dewey number. I don't know. It's a science novel, sure. But I don't want that. I don't like that field. So instead I can say, let me put what I actually want, my Thick Jones in the 092 and it'll use that instead. I'm gonna make an item on here, but first I'm actually gonna dovetail my next thing in my list as well while I'm here. And my next thing is a, another exciting new development. Uh, this is the ability to specify some mark fields as important rather than required. Let me scroll back up here and have a look at the 003, which you can see here is important. So previously, any given field was either required or not. And important gives us a, a nice middle ground. If I delete that value out, let me make sure I hit all my other required stuff. So I don't have an 003, which means when I try to save this, it gives me a little pop-up that says, a few important fields are not filled. Your 003 is blank, but it's not stopping me from saving. I can go ahead and save anyway. It's just giving me that informational thing of, hey, you told me you want an 003 if possible. So this is great for all those mark fields that like really, if there is a value to put there, you want it, but maybe there isn't always something to include. So a good indicator to your catalog is of look at this, but I'm not gonna stop you from saving a record without it. Having done that, back in my item, ta-da, it pulled my 092 like I wanted it to. And if I had deleted that 092 out, it would have checked the 082 next. And pardon me getting a little out of order, but I'm gonna jump back here. That important flag, that is set in your frameworks. So I said the 003 was important. Here's the 003 subfield, important. So again, that tells it, I really would like to have a value here, but I'm not gonna stop you from saving without it. I'll say it again, I said this in the last one, like I think this would be a great training tool yeah. If somebody's new to cataloging, you could go ahead and make these changes to the framework just to get them started and making them aware of what fields potentially need values. And if they, so I think it would be helpful. Yeah, speaking as a bad cataloger, <laughs> once you get past like the six mark fields that are required, they're all sort of equally nebulous to me. So if, if I can have some sort of benchmarks of hit these if you can, it's a great help to me. Speaking of cataloging, I got one more cataloging uh, development or enhancement for you. And I'm gonna go to the cataloging module and I'm gonna go to the advanced editor and I'm gonna click on macros where nothing appears to have changed, but oh my gosh, everybody, everything has changed here. Oh, it's so exciting. Um, so macros have been around for a long time and the one big headache of macros has been that they save in the cache of your browser, which means they're individual to your machine, they're individual to you as a user, and you lose them every time you clear your cache out, which stinks because like one clears one's browser cache fairly often. At the very least, you clear it every time we give you a Koha upgrade. So this enhancement has moved those macros from your browser cache to the Koha database. So that means they don't get deleted when you clear your browser cache and you can access them on any machine. So if you set a bunch of macros up at your desk and then go out to the reference desk, they're still there. 
And it also means, since we're putting them in the database, we may as well let you make them public, which means if I make a macro and I make it public, then when Kelly logs in, she can use my macro. Hooray, it's so cool. Um, yeah, but you're not the greatest cataloger, so I don't know if I'd follow your macro. <laughs> Does it say who created the macro? <laughs> it's fair. I said, um, and I do, th I, I have spoken to people who have kind of held off on macros because the, the prospect of setting them all up and then losing them seemed like more hassle than they wanted, maybe more heartbreak than they were ready for. So to have these in the database is great. Um, speaking of <clears throat> bad catalogers, I should point out, let me go back to a patron. There are a couple permissions here. So you can set any individual user to be able or not able to make shared macros and delete shared macros. So if Kelly wants to lock me out of the shared macros, because mine are junk, she could do that. Um, and yeah, otherwise there's not like a big change here to how these work. I make a macro, I give it a name, Andrew. make it public and how do these work? Can I just say like delete the 999C? I think that'll work. I think that's how that works. Heather would know. Heather wrote most of the macros on the wiki. Maybe I just say Dell. We just All right. Did a, then, we just did a, um, what was it? And something about the advanced editor, a deep dive. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, now my macro is ready to go and just break every record in my system by deleting the bib number out. I don't think Koha will let you do that. I think it's going to save me from myself. And Heather says she's glad she put the macros in the wicket because they kept getting deleted out of her Koha, but no more. All right, I'm moving from there out of cataloging into purchase suggestions. I will say broadly, a bunch of stuff changed in purchase suggestions, a lot of just like nice little ease of use things. So when you go in there, that, that module is gonna look pretty different. The one I'm gonna talk about right now relates to this system preference, max total suggestions and number of suggestion days. Boy, Heather, thank you. Heather has to go. Um, so this is a development that was sponsored by the Round Rock Public Library, so thank you to them. And this is a new way to control the rate at which your patrons can put in purchase suggestions. So we already had a, a system preference that asked how many active suggestions a patron can have at a time. This is a different way to do that that is time-based. So right now I've got it set to each patron can put in one suggestion per one day. Now that's pretty restrictive. Simultaneously kind of restrictive and not. Like that's, a, that's 365 purchase suggestions a year and some patron would do that. So this might not be what you wanna set it to, but it's a good demo. So let me come back over here to my OPAC where I am logged in as my fake patron. And if I come down to purchase suggestions, got a couple in there already. I can make a new one and say dogs. It's a DVD. That must be like the sequel to Cats. Thank you, Kelly, for laughing at my joke. You're welcome. You're welcome. I submit that. And now I have reached my limit of one purchase suggestion in one day, and I can't put in anymore. That's it. I'm blocked. Very straightforward. Also, I was glad to see I cannot cheat. I like back up and try to get back to that entry page. No, it's blocked out. I cannot put in another one. Staff still can. So if I'm a staff member and I go and I find my, my patron, I can put in another one from the staff side. But over here on the OPEC, that's it. I can put in one a day and no more.
And I've got a few more here. And the next one is in the search interface. Hi, Jane. Uh, let me do a search for Batman because I always search for Batman and I really should learn to search for something else sometimes. So this is this enhancement is this button right here, this edit button that if I am in my search results and I click some titles, my edit button turns on and gives me options to batch edit, batch delete, or merge these records. These are all things I could do other ways before, but this is baking those options right into the search uh, interface that I use all the time. I'm really excited about this, particularly merge, because merge you really used to have to kind of sneak up on through some different parts of Koha that you didn't go to for much else. So I'm really excited to see that right here. I just pick my things out of my search results and I say merge and I'm off to the races. So really nice, slick, just giving you fewer reasons to sort of step out of your, your usual screens, bake everything in. Next up, I've got a thing about serials. Let me come into my library journal subscription. And in here, I'm gonna to go to serial collection. This is the page that shows me all my old issues of library journal, everything I've ever received. So this is a great one for libraries that get a lot of serials and also clean those serials out periodically. So if at my library, I collect a year's worth of individual issues of library journal, and then I bind those, make that its own bib and delete those individual issues. Previously, I had to delete those one at a time and deleting things one at a time is no fun. So now let us select all of our issues and delete them in a batch. And even better, because on this particular subscription, I'm creating item records that tie to my serial issues, I have the option to just delete those items as well. I don't have to, if I wanted to keep my items, I could, but yes, let's delete them all. I'm really not gonna do this. Oh, well, Rhonda has a purchase suggestion. Warning, we found that if a patron deletes a purchase suggestion after it is processed, they can add another suggestion. Example, sysprof is set to three suggestions in 30 days, patron puts in three and three. That makes sense. So it's three that exist in that period if they are real quick deleting out their old ones. Yeah, that's a loophole. I want to think about how to plug that loophole. Patrons. Maybe, maybe if it's been accepted, it can't be deleted. Well, and, and Rhonda says, we remove the ability to delete per patron suggestions from the OPEC. Yeah, and that'd solve it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, my serials, I don't really want to delete these. I'm going to leave them here, but that would clear those out. Then I have one more tech services thing. This is over in everybody's favorite bit of Koha, the label creator. OK, so labels. Previously, whenever we wanted to print labels, we had to make a label batch, and we needed to put populate that batch with existing item records. That doesn't work perfectly for libraries that are printing their own barcodes. We had a lot of libraries ask, how can I just generate a sheet of barcodes? I don't want them associated to any items yet. I just want them ready to go. So I have my sheet of stickers that I can apply to items as I use them. So this enhancement adds a new option for barcode range. So instead of creating a batch, I'm just saying, yeah, I'm going to print some barcodes and I'm going to go from there to, oh, oh, not there. That'd be a lot of barcodes. Give me, what have I done? 100,000 through 100,021. And I'm going to print that range on some barcodes. Uh, 
The rest of this process matches what you would see if you were printing barcodes for existing items. It's just this PDF it spits out for me. These are not barcodes that, nest, that exist in my system already. It's just giving me the stickers. And then whenever I want to actually use those, I would scan that barcode into the item record, just like if I had bought a sheet of pre-printed barcodes, just letting me make these in advance. I can put in a barcode range of, of stuff that does actually exist in my collection and get barcodes for actually existent items. But really the, the idea here is that you're going to be doing this independent of existing items and just sort of not making you put those in all your item records, then put those items in a batch, then print the labels, making it easier to just do them all up front, have them ready to go. And that is the last of my tech services things. So Kelly's got a few admin odds and ends to close us out. Let's see if people leave during my presentation. Oh, I mean, no, they won't. Your stuff is more fun. <laughs> I want to say thank you, Rhonda. You know, she's gotten in there. Rhonda is one of our early adopters. Showed her library in addition to a slew of others, and I can call them out if you want because I printed that up email. Um, that they have offered to go to the new 2005 ahead of time and test things out for us, which we are eternally grateful for. And thank you, thank you. So if it's something that interests you, maybe the next round you could raise your hand and say, we wanna do that too. But again, we appreciate the early adopters that get in there and, and test this stuff out, um, which is great to find all the things that, like Rhonda's example with the purchase suggestions, a great thing to find. Okay, here we go. I have administration and it is a fantastic, um, uh, oh, I keep on forgetting, like the share is getting weird. I like Andrew's share. He shared just a part of his screen. I share my whole screen. I am going, oh no, <gasps> somebody is leaving during my parts. I'm trying. Bye. Thank you so much. We, the recording is available. So when we, you know, YouTube living, it's already out there. So I have just three, so it'd be nice and short. There are what's known as plugins in the Koha community. And that is just another way for some fancy thing to be added to your Koha system without it being integrated into Koha. And they're known as plugins. In 2005, you will now have the option to search plugins through your staff client. Previously, when you wanted to search the available plugins through Bywater or various other um, developer sites, you would go to generally like a GitHub site and find that, download the plugin and then install it to your system. Now you can do it right from your staff interface and this is fantastic. Right now, this is searching um, our plugins through Bywater as well as Theek Solutions, I believe are the two that we'll be searching here. Under administration, there is the option for manage plugins. This will play all the plugins that you have installed on your site. Now will allow you to search plugins and this will again go out to a different source, almost like Mana for plugins. I search, yes, the cover flow is a fantastic example of a great plugin. If I search for report, I can see that there are a few different plugins that have the word report in the title. And this would allow me, this chat in the way, this chat box is in the way, to install it right here over on the right hand side. Maybe our pictures are in there. Or any of these names, I can go look at the documentation that's involved, what it actually does, other than a little bit of the description. So this is a great, this is a great feature for anyone who has never used plugins. This could give you a little dabble without having to go to another site. We have a great, I believe, Monday Minutes on plugins that you can, can watch and go check them out. Oh, let me, I popped over into another tab and I never went. There we are. 
So this gives me my a little bit of information and then some documentation about that specific plugin. So that's a great ooh, new feature. Something else that is happening um, to Koha is it is actually removing a lot of the OPAC customization system preferences out of the system preferences. So you have system preferences OPAC header, OPAC main user book. And these system preferences allowed you to use HTML and push out customizations to your OPAC. Koha is slowly started moving those over into the tools news section. So under the um, tools module, there is an option for news. This has been here forever and ever functionality has gotten exponentially bigger. Let me tell you that once they move to OPAC stuff over here, you, once your system goes live on 2005, anything that was in those system preferences, your logo, your hours, anything that was driving those customizations on your OPAC will be moved over to the news by itself. Like you do not have to do anything to this area, but it's good to know this is where they live now. If you did need to edit or make any new um, areas of customization, you were gonna go to the news section. If you've never been into the news section before, entries, display location will be where it's going to display. And this is where it got exponentially bigger. You used to be able to just say, is this gonna be on the staff client or is this gonna be on the OPAC? And then you probably had this one area called news and that kind of sat right above your cover flow. Now you have the option to add an OPAC header, or alter your OPAC header, custom search, your main user block. So that's your big block in the center, the credits, that's the bottom, and then the login instructions. When this was released, um, in 1911, part of this OPAC nav right was moved over here. So you maybe have seen it or played around with it. I think there was a Monday minutes on that too, um, how to use this new feature. Um, but it's again, expanding, and I believe in 2011, we'll move more things. The pros, it's, um, it's easier for libraries that don't know HTML to be able to customize their OPAC. Two, it's easier to translate. So this is going to be great for the community overall. And it took away five system preferences. So I mean, yeehoo, we got less system preferences. So again, this really doesn't have anything to do with what you have to do when you go live on 2005. It's just a new location for the HTML that was in those system preferences. one you guys great Ooh, I have 10 minutes to spare I can go kind of slow no I'm just kidding I won't under Koha administration there is a fantastic nugget of gold that exists and it is called column configurations this allows you to throughout Koha tell Koha what to display and what not to display this is a global thing so if I were to hide the call numbers in my item table, all the call numbers would be hidden from everybody. But it does allow you to customize what you see and what you don't see. This has always been here. Every release, we seem to be adding more things to column configuration. This one thing is huge. It is the ability to configure the item table. And if you were watching Andrew very closely when he was doing one of his demonstrations, he had to expose columns that I had actually hidden during my testing. So if I go over to configure columns, there are different areas where you can configure the columns. My one I want to talk about today is under catalog. And the new table is the holdings table. And I can go ahead and hide things like item type holding branch, status, item call number, and that would eliminate those columns from being seen. But if you're watching Andrew close, he could un unhide them so he could see them when he's in that screen, but this will drive what the default is. 
You also have one more option if you are a multi-branch system and you are separating out your holdings and other holdings in the item tab, then you can manipulate that um, view as well. So let me just pop over to where I'm talking about because you're probably all like, Kelly, you're not making it very clear. I'm sure I am, but you know, okay. So let's go searching for the lost tombs of Egypt. So this is the items holding table. Now, there are libraries out there that have jQuery that we've done this for you a different way using some sort of very magic special sauce that Lucas does. But now you can go ahead and do that without doing it and have more control as the library. Anywhere you see this little spoke, is that what it's called, the sprocket? Um, you can configure the columns under configure columns. So this will give you an indication that it actually lives somewhere and you could go ahead and alter that view. Another great place that people don't know you can configure, notices and slips. I mean, how many of those columns do you actually need to see? Do you wanna see the library that it's at or the code? You can configure those columns too. Reports, you can configure what you see. In 2005 course reserves and what you see on the OPAC is now configurable. So go play around with that one. That one's fun and that one exists now for lots of areas, but not this item holding tab table. Gear cog. I know, I don't know what it's called. I think everybody's excited. I can hear the cheering from here. Or is that not? You should let all those librarians be so close to your house. <laughs> <laughs> this is a um, just a brief introduction of what we find are the new features and enhancement, but trust me, there is plenty of other areas that are getting improved on. We have the, um, each module is broken into a blog post and we've expanded on the things that we found in the release notes. So patrons and CERC has a blog post, technical services, admin and, and reports. So there is more um, documentation to read up on and get ready for 2005. In what, oh, two weeks, I think, we are going to have a couple of question and answer webinars that we would love for you to buy and ask questions about what you read about or saw or you want to see some functionality because you don't have five yet know that you can go to our demo site and play around to and to get to our demo site if you are not familiar if you go to our bywater solutions.com main page and scroll to the bottom there it is there's our demo links and how to how to log in these do um clear out every three hours so if you do make some changes and play around with some things do not expect them to stay like that um but they will clear out and you can continue around but they are this is on 2005 right now well, this is this is a lot going on here this is fun that reset also means no matter how bad you break it, it'll fix itself. So go to town. We need that on our test site, right, Andrew? <laughs> Are there any questions or excited thoughts? For all the East Coasters, their day is ending. Mm -hmm. the West Coasters are like, we're hungry. Some thank yous and good features in YouTube. Good, awesome. Well, get excited. Please read our documentation. Come to our what's our question and answer time and ask your questions. And we're happy to help. Thank okay. You, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Stay safe. Yeah, it's coming up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm.